Are you ready? The Cornelia Stephanie Show. Wake up to love your call to action. Join Cornelia as she empowers others to live heaven on earth. Cornelia teaches listeners how to be the authority over yourself, embracing your inner guru. Feel yourself uplifted into limitless expansion, integrating ease and grace in a changing world. This show will cover topics such as unconditional love, your physical body, how to be in extraordinary relationships, create financial and emotional wealth, embracing entrepreneurship in the new earth. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cornelia Stephanie Show. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you as always. Today's Friday, and we have our Stories of Hope series to offer hope and inspiration in a changing world. And our first guest today is Megan Babcock, and she's here. She's a guide to transformation. She is passionate in helping people transform trauma, and she is a life coach and speaker. And she also hosts an empowering uh, podcast that is called It's Your Story to Tell. She has 21 years of diverse healthcare experience and specialized training as a nurse coach, functional medicine nurse, and design thinking certified professional. She empowers individuals to overcome adversity and create meaningful change in their lives. Welcome to the show today, Megan Babcock. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation and share some thoughts with your audience. So we were talking before we came live about what is it that you wanted to highlight today for the audience? What's the what's the inspiring story that you wanted to share? And you wanted to give us a little bit of a background from, from your story. Sure. So for me, I wanted to just share how powerful our thinking is. Um, I didn't realize that my thinking was having such an impact on my life, although I knew my life did not feel aligned. So I was um, overwhelmed, exhausted, uh, but you would never know that if you looked at my social media or you met me, I was climbing the corporate ladder to being very successful in my career. I had beautiful children who always looked perfect. And yet I was in an abusive marriage and it wasn't until things came really crashing down. Um, I would say a rock bottom moment. And if you're in a rock bottom moment, good news, that is where you can transform and take your life to wherever you want it to go. Um, it was what I needed in order to admit the reality. You know, that's the first step for me is if you if you can't admit where you truly are, you can't really change. And so when I came to this rock bottom moment and I had um, DHS in my home, um, I was very fortunate. I had a woman named Julia, who I consider my guardian angel, who showed up. She was a domestic violence advocate. And I. it was the first time that I was really able to admit the reality of my situation. And from that point forward, Julia walked with me and helped me to understand just how my thoughts were creating this reality. And we did a lot of inner child healing work to identify where and what thoughts began to create this reality that I was living. Um, and from there, I was able to decide if if those thoughts were helping me or if they were hurting me, if they weren't in alignment, then what do you do with them? And so I learned how to transform my thinking. And now I get to live the life that's truly aligned with myself and what I feel created for. And the work I do now is all about being able to give back what was given to me um, in that rock bottom moment. I just want to say, you know, um, kudos to the guardian angel that was showing up for you. You know, just having somebody in, where was the organization, D D H, The Department of Human Services. So that's when um, someone turns you in, or in this case, it wasn't me, but it was my um, my spouse at the time um, for an, an abusive incident. And 
there's not a lot of them out there. And I was just so fortunate that that DHS worker brought a domestic violence advocate along with them to the meeting because I had tried to leave many times, which is the story of many, um, most women. It takes on average at least seven times, and that's if you get out alive um, from a domestic violence relationship. Yeah, so many, I mean, so much kudos to her for being mm -hmm. able to help you then see that the reality that you were living, that it was toxic, that it was scary, that it was awful, and that you needed to get out, it also showed you where, what thoughts you were thinking and how that was actually affecting your reality. So I'm curious as to what were those thoughts? <laughs> so I, you know, when we, when I first started the journey with her, I, I didn't even know I, I had grown up in a, what I would consider a really solid home with two parents and went to, um, Christian schools. We were involved in our church, um, close to my grandparents. And it wasn't until we just really started getting curious and peeling back layers. And the more comfortable I got with her, you know, she was in a domestic violence relationship. So she understood the way of thinking. And, and so she just knew how to talk to me and make me feel comfortable. And as I um, began to get curious and remember things from my past, I recognized that there had been things that I had never admitted as trauma or really acknowledge um, in um, things that were inappropriate between kids touching um, sexual things that um, I just had kind of blocked out. Um, and then the really big um, revelation for me was that at 16, um, I was raped and I was not where I was supposed to be. So I was uh, afraid to tell my parents. Also, um, I was um, very involved in my church. At that point in time, there was this, this study called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. So there was just all of this pressure to not be honest or come forward with things. Um, and because I didn't want to be different. And at that moment, I said to myself, I will never have a good husband. Wow. And I had two um, marriages prior to the healthy marriage that I am in today. Um, and, and both were different, but um, unhealthy in their own ways. Um, and the, when my marriage first marriage ended, I didn't do any work. I was so devastated and um, thought, wow, this is not what God intended. Then I had a lot of the religious beliefs around um, divorce and things like that and ended up in a, a worse relationship that was very toxic and physically, emotionally, and sexually abusive. Um, but then I didn't know how to get out. I became pregnant. I was out, that was out of wedlock. So it just kept compounding. Um, and the guilt and shame uh, was just keeping me from really getting the help I needed and in, in doing the emotional discovery to find out why are these behaviors, I'm not even enjoying my life. Um, so, but I couldn't look at it because I had so much shame. Yeah. So there was a lot of healing that had to, had to take place, a lot of realizations to, to have, but I love that, that you discovered it. I will never have a good, when you said, I will never have a good husband. I'll never be in a good relationship. When you said that, when you realized that, um, and associated to something back from your past and how that was the, um, turning point mm -hmm. of, of everything. And now uh, you have a new belief mm -hmm. and now you have a different reality, but you're also helping others create realities that are more in alignment with who they really are as a soul being. Mm -hmm. So um, what, uh, how is it that people can look you up on social media or learn more about you, your website? Yeah. So if you go to itsyourstorytotell.com, you will find um, everything there. 
And there are other coaches that work alongside of me because just like Julia knew my story because it had been her story and she gave me a lot of comfort to be able to be honest and talk to her because I didn't feel judged. She had been there and she had transformed her life. So there was also hope. So our coaches all share their story and um, that way you can find somebody who really might fit well to work with you because they've they've been on that path. So there are five other women alongside of me and then we have a podcast called It's Your Story to Tell and we bring people on much like you are doing today to talk about our hard stories and how um, the path we took to transform our life to be able to bring hope into their their life so that they can do the hard work because it is hard work when you have to look at everything that you have been running from all of this time and start to sort through it and decide if it is helping you or if it is hurting you. And as you continue to make those alignments on your path, you just start to have a more joyful, fulfilled life. And it's just such a joy to come alongside people and watch these transformations. Um, it's just, it brings so much joy to my life to know that all things that I went through are now being used for good. And uh, it gives me such a great understanding of how to meet people in their crisis and their trauma in their shame so that they can experience transformation too. Yeah. And the shame is heavy. The shame is heavy. It's a very dark, dark energy. It's an emotional core wound. Uh, you know, it's an emotional core wound. And the opposite of the shame is shine. Mm, and I love we're that. here to transform <laughs> that to really release and heal uh, the shame because we are God's children and we are meant to shine. And mm. we're not meant to, you know, um, walk with tar. So that's how I, how I healed my shame is to... Um, I, that's how I described it. I felt like there was just tar all over me. And um, so that's deep work, hard work. And it's good that you all are working together. Uh, you know, the women that are supporting, when is your podcast and where can people find that? So it's on my website, but it's also anywhere that you listen to podcasts and as well on YouTube. And we release podcasts on Friday. I'm getting ready to go on a pause um, and I will be coming back with a, a series that is going to be talking about domestic violence and um, narcissistic abuse in the um, end of the year. So um, I hope people will turn in tune into that if that's part of your story. Um, it's a hard journey, but it is one worth taking and you can have the, the life and the relationship that you were created and designed for. And that is one of love and connection and respect. So beautiful. Uh, I definitely want to have you come back where we can have a longer discussion for, you know, just going into the domestic violence piece. I think it's such a huge piece. You know, mm -hmm. we have to stand for and say no especially for um, the children that are looking yeah. to us, that are watching us, and mm -hmm. what kind of a world are we creating? I grew up in a domestic violence home, so mm -hmm. I know this one, and I swore as a little kid, I will never allow a man to do this to me. And so it's, it's a topic that I'm very passionate about too. I want to thank you, Megan, uh, for coming on the show and congratulations uh, to all your hard work and how far you've come and the work that you're doing in, in helping heal the world. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. We're going to take a break on the Cornelia Stephanie show. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for listening and tuning into the Cornelia Stephanie Show. Our next guest today is Brooke Kikos. She helps those who feel alone and lost to discover their truth and stand in their personal power using her training as ma magnetic mindset coach, rapid transformational therapist, RTT. She's also a clinical hypnotherapist and relationship mentor, having spent 35 years trapped in a religious sector, indoctrination, abuse, and trauma were prevalent. She was raised by a narcissistic abusive father, and she got stuck, stuck in toxic relationship cycles. Welcome to the show today, Brooke. 
Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. So you've got a lot of skills. You've got a lot of therapies. You've got a lot of things that you're doing to help people transform. Yes, completely. Yeah. Yeah. This is what it's all about. Right. And so mm -hmm. you, you know, is this the reason why you ended up going into this field? Because you, um, you were in the, the, the things that you found yourself in, in your life with your narcissistic father and then the uh, mm -hmm. religious programming and, and whatever um, the abuse that you just, you experienced there. Is that the reason why you Completely. went into this field? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I felt very stuck um, when I left the cult and my abusive marriage and needed to do some healing. And I was really finding myself stuck in traditional talk therapy. And so I went on this big journey of saying, you know what, this is not working. So I'm going to find what does. And that's why I do the work that I do, because I find that it is deeply needed right now in this time where people are wanting transformation. They're dealing with really difficult things. Mental health is a huge struggle now, um, especially since COVID and you know, all of the anxiety that we kind of see in the world today. So I felt like, you know what, this is why I do what I do. And I want people to break free from the things that are holding them back. Yeah. Uh, it's really important. Uh, like you said, right now, there's so many things that people are experiencing. I think um, I, I didn't write this statistic down, but I heard, heard about this last week. And I vaguely remember it as being the number one the number one thing in the world right now that we as a humanity is facing is healthcare. It's 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 our wellness. It's our healthcare. That's that's the number one thing because there are so many things that are going on that um, it's not AI. It's not you know um, it's healthcare. So mm -hmm. mental health, emotional health, physical health. Yeah. Uh, all, all of that. So the more, I think the more people like you that are out there doing this work, it's it's really, really important. We were talking a little bit about grief before we came live on the show. And that's a topic that's also very near and dear to you. What would you like to say about that? Yeah. So I've been very intimate with grief. I like to say, I like to call it my companion instead of thinking of it as this horrible thing. Um, I feel like grief really transformed my life. Um, it ignited a spiritual awakening for myself. Um, after leaving the cult, I was very um, angry with religion, angry at God, not knowing what to believe or who to believe or who to trust. And uh, when my ex-husband actually died, when he was the father of my children, that ignited that spiritual awakening because I desired to know more. I wanted to know more of why we are here, why we exist, what, you know, what is my purpose? Um, in that grief, in that deep pain, in that deep loss, is where I was able to witness, um, you know, instead of looking at life as, oh my gosh, why am I having to feel this pain? How can this pain transform me? How can this grief really help me look at life in a different way? Or how can it help me become who I've always been meant to be? Um, and witnessing my children grieve, I also recognize that grief also is this way to connect more deeply with other human beings, right? In love and connection and um, being able to see compassion and empathy in ourselves. And I feel like there's just, this is just a way to really um, enjoy the human experience, even when it's painful. And I know that sounds so backwards. And some people are gonna be like, if they're in the grieving process, they're gonna be like, what? Like, you know, cause they're angry, right? There's the, always that, that's what, there's an angry part of grief, right? And when you're in that space, it's okay to be in that space too. But I feel like it's also really important to recognize that when you get through that and you come into acceptance, that's when you can start to start to really feel the lessons around grief. Well, I think, you know, even um, the idea that people have that anger is bad. Um, anger mm -hmm. is not bad. Anger is a raw human emotion that all of us humans have. Mm -hmm. um, it's what we do with our anger that is one thing. And then the other thing, when it comes to anger, um, there's always a truth underneath that anger uh, that is waiting to be discovered because we're angry about something, 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 something. And underneath that anger, there's always, what is the truth underneath there? You know, cause we, on the top, we may be angry about something and um, feel bad about being ang angry, but, um, the anger is actually a tool 
that can be used for liberation, um, as does grief. Like you yeah. said, you made grief your friend. Um, so yeah, I I I think that grieving the loss of a, a dying world in itself right now. There's yes. so many, right? Because right now there's just so much change that so much change that we're going through that, you know, whether it is that we're experiencing loss of a relationship or loss mm -hmm. of a parent or children, a pet, um, it's difficult. And what happens to people when they don't process their grief? What happens to the body? It stays stuck. We don't realize that, but it really does stay stuck in the body. And that's a lot, I feel like, really connected to where illness comes from, where autoimmune disease comes from, because you do it. You know, I noticed in my own healing journey from grief, grieving, losing a community, grieving, losing my ex-husband, right? Losing all of these things, grief sat in my chest. And when I had to actually face my grief instead of suppressing it or avoiding it, that's where I felt it, you know, that resistance and that feeling of, you know, that heaviness of what grief feels like. Um, and when you finally begin to witness it and you let yourself just grieve and know that it's not going to wipe you out completely, just trust that you can move through it, that this too shall pass. Um, you start to just be more willing and accepting of that grief. And I think that's why just letting everybody know that, you know what, that you can get through this really difficult time with this grief. Um, you know, if I can do it, you can do it, right? We are this one in the same, right? And if, you know, you've witnessed other people do it, how can you take this grief and how can you let it teach you? And I feel like life is always teaching us through our experiences. And when we allow that, we really can um, be able to do it. And, and the one way that I did it, I felt like was expressing it through art and creativity. And so I created a children's book called the grief monster and it was an honor of my two children and their loss of their father but what i really wanted to do was teach children the emotional intelligence to understand what grief is to accept help when there is grief right to ask for support to ask for help because a lot of times even adults will sit in our grief and will isolate ourselves and say you know what i don't want to be a burden to anybody else but the message here is to ask for the support you know, if you can't, if there's, you feel like there's no one around you will then gain the support somehow that you need, because we thrive in connection. It's a human need. And this is how we can kind of get out of this space of depression and feeling like we're all alone in the world because we're really not. Yeah. I, I think that's so powerful, especially for the children today. Um, you know, where they need all the tools and the, the support that, they can get. I think this needs to be taught in school. I always felt like human emotion, emotional freedom, emotional um, processing, how to process emotion. It should be, you know, taught in the school system. That, um, should be part of our, uh, you know, it, it should be part of the curriculum because mm -hmm. it's so important on how to process anger and not use anger to bully someone, but to really process anger. Um, this is great what you're doing. And, you know, I always had the idea that I wanted to have a t-shirt that said, I'm grieving. <laughs> oh my then, gosh. I love that. Yes. Right? I'm grieving. And then when you go to the store or whatever, it just boom, it has the, you know, I'm grieving. And so then right away, the person that sees you is able to go, oh, mm -hmm. um, you know, and right away, extend compassion. And maybe if you know that I'm grieving, maybe that's why I'm not smiling right now. I'm 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 looking like this because I'm really I'm grieving. I, I you know, letting each other know how how we're feeling, right? Yes. Yeah. And not being afraid to show somebody compassion that's a stranger. Right. We don't know. And I think I love that when you're like, let's just put a, like a sign, right? Like a sign on our t-shirt. So we can actually really just sit with people and be kind to people because we don't know what they're going through. We have no idea what's going on behind closed doors. And yet we treat each other, you know, in, in not loving ways. And it's more of like, okay, how can we bring more love to this world? How can we show more support for people? And it's just like by saying those kind words, yeah, by giving that compassion to each and every person. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the, definitely, it's more authentic. It's more, it's mm -hmm. a, a more, 
more authentic way of life and it's a more honoring way of life. I want to be able to let the audience know how they can look you up on social media and find uh, find you and also, uh, you know, the work that you do. Sure. So I'm Life Coaching Goddess on all the social media platforms. And my website is lifecoachinggoddess.com. So they can reach out to me there. They can set up a consultation if they're wanting to dive deeper into understanding more about themselves, their psyche, or if they're trying to move through something so they can transform their lives. Yes. And by all means, you know, get that book from you. Is that book that you've written, is that available on Amazon or? Yes, it is. The Grief Monster is available on Amazon. So yeah, you guys can grab a copy. And honestly, I... Um, I've heard so many things, even adults have written me and said, oh my gosh, I bought this for my mother, you know, that just lost, you know, so it's like recognizing that even adults can find the inner child within themselves totally, and deal with that grief the way they need to as well. That's awesome, Brooke. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, we're going to take a break on the Cornelia Stephanie show. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Our next guest is Bradley Hall. He's a trauma-trained transform transformational mindset coach, and his mission is to provide a safe space for healing and empower clients on their transformative journeys. Uh, inspired by a significant life event in 2005, he has committed to studying human behavior and developing a unique approach to personal growth, focusing on self-awareness. Key achievements include a master's degree in in-depth archetype, archetypal psychology, certification as a trauma recovery coach, mindfulness instructor, and holistic life coach. All things wellness. Welcome to the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yes. So how did you, you know, you, you in order to do the work that you were doing, you must have found um, trauma appear in your life. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, sometimes, uh, it was early on in my childhood and sometimes we, we become accustomed to what we believe is a normalcy, right? It's standard deviancy. We're exposed to things that we think is normal. And sometimes it takes a while to sort that out in our uh, adulthood, uh, that maybe things aren't, weren't so normal. Maybe our behavior isn't so much, so normal. And, um, so I, I experienced some childhood trauma, very traumatic things. Um, we we don't have time to go into all that here, uh, but that led me into my early twenties, where I was. I realized one day that I was actually my late twenties uh, is when when the revolution began, my my internal spiritual revolution. Uh, that I realized that my behavior wasn't in line with my values of who I thought I was and who I wanted to be, and I committed to a radical shift at that point to. To begin to understand why I did the things I did, why I, I acted the way I did, uh, why I thought the way I did, and to try to unravel that whole thing. Wow. So do you um do you mind sharing like what what some of those things were? Like what did you discover that was really big for you? Or is that something that you'd rather not share? No, I I there's a lot. <laughs> there there's a tremendous amount. Uh, I just, I, I almost, I almost destroyed, I almost destroyed my family. So I have, I met my wife when she was 14, I was 16. And we had my son when she was 15 and I was 17. So we started very young. Uh, we had two boys that were three years apart. Uh, she also had uh, her own trauma from her own childhood. And we basically conspired for a dysfunctional marriage and had no idea that that's what we were doing. And uh, I almost completely destroyed my marriage and one day just woke up and thought I, I had to just reevaluate what, what is going on? What am I doing? I thought, I thought I wanted a divorce. I thought I wanted to leave. And I just one day had a moment of clarity and that's what it takes. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it has to become so dark uh, that you, it's so dark that when the pinpoint of light comes through, it, it shines extremely bright and finally gets your attention and, and wakes you up. Wow. Yeah. So are you still married today? Absolutely. We've been married. Uh, we've been together over 36 years. We've been married for 33. Wow. 
So, and your kids. And so you almost destroyed, like you said, destroyed the marriage. And then you had the realization and you discovered that um, there, there were, that you didn't want to throw the, the marriage out, that you wanted to work on yourself. That's right. And, and even more to it, uh, more to it, my wife and I had basically grown up together. I mean, we met when she was 14, I was 16. By this time we were in our, you know, 33, 31, when the, when we almost divorced, we realized we had spent over half our lives together and we had grown up together. And so we committed to working on ourselves together, which ultimately led to rebuilding the marriage the way, the way we wanted it, the way, you know, we, we, we grew up and we inherit all these beliefs that we don't even know that, that we've adopted. And that's what, when I work with people, I work uh, on, on identity reconstruction and reconciliation. And the difference between the two is identity reconstruction is rebuilding who you are. Reconciliation is reconciling that with the past and being able to be okay with everything that's happened because whatever you've done in your past has led you to here. If that didn't happen, this wouldn't have happened. And that's hard for people to understand. <clears throat> but my wife and I decided we had in, we had inherited all these beliefs, which we do as children, it, pro predominantly before the age of seven. We adopt all these beliefs and we don't even know we adopted them. So basically we, as adults, we've created who we are. We just think we're this person, but we actually have agreed to be this person. Right. So what we focused on was who do we want to be from here as individuals? And then how do we want our what do we want our marriage to look like? And so we began investigating and researching and seeing, asking people who've been married for for many, many years, the people we wanted to be like. We began asking them questions, began understanding, began talking about it. And we basically cleaned out both closets, put everything on the table, threw out what we didn't want, kept what we wanted, and rebuilt our lives and our marriage. Is your wife a coach too? Uh, she is not. She's very shy. Uh, she's very sweet and very shy, but she is my rock and my ground and my support. There's no doubt about it. So I, I, I guess I speak through her in that, in that sense. Yeah. No, I, I just think that there is a, uh, an opportunity. I'm, I'm not saying that there isn't an opportunity to work on help people with trauma because there's a lot of trauma, but also there's an opportunity, you know, to help people stay married and, um, you know, that's, that's a big piece because that's one of the things that, you know, I don't know what the divorce rate is nowadays where people really want to, um, get a divorce and then, you know, they take action on it. And that's not something that you did. You, I don't know what you were planning on doing with destroying, but even getting a divorce and people nowadays, you know, um, do they have do they have the tools to do the work and to do the relationship work and do what it is that you and your wife did? Yeah, yeah. And so we find ourselves very fortunate that, that we're here. We've done a lot of work and we're very proud of that. But we we somehow found some direction and and we're grateful that that happened because it could have happened a thousand times and we didn't find this direction and end up end up here. And we we know that most of the time people don't know where to go and what to do to make that happen. That, that's the biggest thing. And so when people become in opposition, one one begins to be, dig in and be de defensive and it causes the other one to dig in and be defensive. And then we build our defenses and then we never, we were a never able to be vulnerable and penetrate. And we were able to do that somehow. So we like to share that with other people for sure. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I there's great opportunities there. You said that you also found out uh, another traumatic experience that your biological father wasn't your biological, that you thought your biological wasn't your biological father. Yeah. Through an at-home DNA test in 2018, I discovered that my, the man I grew up with that I called dad uh, was in fact, not my, my biological father. And and you found that out through the DNA test? The at-home DNA test. Yes. Which is, which is a new phenomenon because of the increasing popularity of at-home DNA tests. Uh, this, there, this is a thing. There are a lot of people. I joined an organization and I've been helping people since that happened in 2018 in this organization who, who discovered this information. I've been helping them, uh, begin their identity reconstruction to make sense of the whole thing and be, and to move forward. That must've felt like a betrayal. Indeed it was. And it comes with a myriad of confusing emotions. As you can imagine, uh, there's initial confusion. Uh, you see all these names that you don't know who they are, you, and you you can't really get any answers. Everyone's defensive. Everyone's got different stories. Uh, some people are no longer in the picture. They 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 passed away. 
Uh, then you begin to break down all the things that you may have missed. Uh, you begin to break down all the memories of things that didn't make sense to you as a kid, but but somewhere in the back of your mind, you knew something wasn't right. Suddenly you had suddenly you had answers for all that that you didn't know that you needed. Uh, and and so a lot of that with that comes working through, <clears throat> for example, one of the one of the things most people are upset with is that they missed out. They have a biological family that's that's they're all in their 30s, 40s, 50s. They miss out on that. And we have to work through the fact that uh, that may be true, but it could have also been just as bad as it would have been good, right? You may we have a tendency to have, to make up this fairy tale in our mind. Oh, uh, where you're running through the fields and you embrace your biological father and all your biological siblings are around and and you're dancing in the sun rays like a movie, and we all know that that's not real world. And so I I I had to look at. Uh, yeah, I, I may have missed some things, but they may not have all been good. And again, what I did go through made me who I am today. And I, and that's what I have to be grateful for because what, it's what I have in my hands. Yeah, that's so good. That's so good. I want to let the audience know how they can find you on social media and look up the work that you do. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, I, I have actually have my first book coming out uh, in October. Uh, okay. It kind of tells my whole story. I go into uh, to depth about the marriage. Uh, but my website, people can find me on my website at thebradleyhall.com. Uh, and on social media, you can find me with uh, Bradley Hall. I'm also on uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, and it's pretty much The Bradley Hall. The Bradley Hall. Well, yeah. I want to thank you so much, Bradley, for coming on the show today yeah. and good luck with your book. Uh, how was that experience getting that book completed? must have been quite a journey. So I'm a writer and I, I'm working on my PhD in psychology. This took me almost 20 years, but you, it's evolved so much. It's changed. My mindset has changed along the way. I want to make sure it was exactly what I wanted to say to people. So it's 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 been very cathartic and I'm, I'm so excited to release it and I hope it, it helps people. Congratulations. It's a labor of love. We're yeah. going to take a break on the Cornelia Stephanie show. We'll be right back, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for listening and tuning into the Cornelia Stephanie Show. Our next guest is Dr. Danielle Angela. She's a profit strategist, a money coach, a chiropractor, hypnotherapist, and neurosomatic release practitioner. Danielle started her healthcare career while in high school and today has over 20 years of experience in the holistic health and wellness industry. Welcome to the show today, Dr. Danielle Angela. Thank you so much for having me. Um, two two first names like me. Yes, I was just thinking the same thing, actually. Yeah. Oh, maybe I was reading your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> or you were reading mine. Who knows? But it was there. We both saw it. Yes. So that's so great. So, um, wow, you have you have quite the wellness career, uh, holistic health and well-being. Um, that you've been in, and um, you want you have a particular topic that you want to talk talk today about, and that is narcissism. Yes, and I think having heard my credentials is so important for people that might also be experiencing narcissistic abuse in a relationship, because I had all of those credentials, and then still move forward into a relationship with someone who was a narcissist, and I didn't even realize it. I studied psychology, I have a bachelor's degree in social work, and despite all of the training and education that I had, I, um, I, I was unable to acknowledge or unable unwilling to see the red flags in the relationship for, right from the start really um and I continued that relationship for 12 years actually before enough lines had been crossed that I decided this relationship was not in integrity for me anymore and it was time for me to figure out how to end it um which it wasn't the first time at that point that I had considered leaving the relationship but it was the first time that I was like really serious I really I was I was like I really mean it this time <laughs> oh goodness so um that's that's a big part of the reason why I I like to be able to share my story and 
um, my experience because I know that if I didn't know what the warning signs were, the red flags, if I didn't understand, um, you know, all of the years that I was experiencing physical abuse, financial abuse, mental and emotional, psychological abuse. And I kept thinking, if I just keep working on myself, this will get better. And it wasn't getting better. Um, that if I didn't know those things and other people also don't know those things. So I think um, now that I'm two years removed from that relationship, it's it's almost felt like a duty, a calling in a way for me to share that experience so that I can help other people who maybe, and the ideal scenario, maybe help other people avoid getting into a relationship or committing to a relationship with a narcissist. Um, best case scenario, they they realize what the red flags are and they're able to end the relationship if that's the right next step. Um, and, you know, if nothing else, to just understand what you're actually experiencing, what you're actually facing. Um, and, and if you don't choose to end the relationship, then you can at least uh, develop different coping strategies. What were the top uh, five flags in the beginning that you knew in the beginning that you saw um, mm -hmm. up? That's a great question. So one of them was love bombing. And I didn't actually know and at the time that I was being love bombed. I just thought that this person really loves me and, and expresses love to me in a way that I hadn't ever experienced before wow. with gifts and acts of service and words of affirmation, you know, um, it, it just felt wonderful. And of course, when, when you're being love bombed, what happens is you, you start to create a lot of oxytocin in your brain and then it can feel addicting um, and this almost happens it seems on purpose whether a narcissist knows this or not that they then suddenly at some point withdraw and stop the love bombing and your brain is so primed for yeah. that uh, for the love bombing to be to be happening that when it's suddenly withdrawn you feel like desperate to get it back and so that desperation that I experienced within the first probably four months of the relationship, that should have been a red flag to me um, very quickly, and especially, you know, give, being given the silent treatment, um, that that was another red flag very early on. And um, there was there was often gaslighting and and there were some things that I that I experienced in the relationship that I don't know if there are clinical terms for. But one thing that I noticed with this person was that an event would happen and they would retell the event in ways that were exaggerated. <laughs> and I would think, gosh, that's that's not really what happened. But maybe we just have different perspectives. But that happened consistently. And I don't know that there's a term for that. Maybe it's grandiosity. Um, but my intuition was always like, this, this is not it. Okay. And what I know now is that narcissists lie and they lie often. They lie with a straight face. They lie and tell you they're not lying. Um, and so that was just a form of lying for that person, the, the exaggeration. And the exaggeration was often to serve their own needs or to, to get an emotional response from another person. Well, one thing's for sure when it comes to a narcissist, and if you find yourself in a relationship with a narcissist, I really think having a support person to help you get out or, you know, navigate that, you know, it, 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 it's really important because otherwise, um, you know, it can go on possibly also for years like it did for you. Uh, I have another question for you. You know, do you think narcissists know that they are narcissists? Yes, I do. At least the one that I was in a relationship with, I do think that um, that person knows that their behavior is not okay. Um, but it's almost as if it's an addiction. Like they, they can't stop. They can't change their behavior. And I think underneath it all, it's just too painful for them to acknowledge. It's too painful for them to acknowledge the hurt that they cause other people. And that's why so many of them don't change because they're unwilling and unable to acknowledge how their behavior harms people. Because then that would be a tremendous amount of guilt, emotion, and everything that they would have to deal with 
um, because you know there there was a certain agenda that they carried on of manipulation and you know yeah manipulation bullying and whatever um, that then if you that's probably why it becomes too much too overbearing to to change it um, you also had mentioned that alcoholism was also part of your lessons throughout this whole whole time um what can you say about that my gut feeling was that uh, my my partner was an alcoholic and other family members even said to me I believe that this person is an alcoholic and needs help and I thought well, maybe I didn't really want to acknowledge it either um but one thing that I know now that I didn't understand then was that all the times that I would say, you have to stop drinking, you have to stop drinking or else this will happen. If you don't stop drinking, this will be the end of our relationship. What I was really asking that person to do was to take away their coping strategy, their coping mechanism, right? And so while it didn't make sense to me because I'm not an alcoholic, I don't experience addiction to alcohol or to any other drugs. I thought, like, why can't you just stop doing this? This would be what's best for everyone around us. Um, and so I continue to feel hurt and injured and insulted by their inability or unwillingness to change their behavior. I thought it was as simple as that. But I understand now that the alcohol wasn't the problem per se. The alcohol for that person was... Um, a mechanism of dealing with the other problems. <laughs> so um, to take that mechanism away and then leave that person with no coping strategies, no coping mechanisms wouldn't have necessarily been helpful either. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that was, those were quite um, some lessons. You got some deep psychology uh, through all of that experience and good for you for getting out now and helping others with this very um, abusive, non-honoring, you know, experience. Yes. Uh, let's tell the audience how they can look you up on social media and find you. Sure. Yep. Uh, you're welcome to come connect with me on Facebook or Instagram. I'm at Dr. Danielle Angela in both of those places. Um, I do share a lot about my own experience in my personal life as well as uh, my business as well. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Angela, for uh, Danielle Angela, for coming on and for being so open and authentic with us about this, because I know there's many people out there that are in those kinds of relationships and are looking for a way out. And maybe today was the day that they feel the courage to make that call. Thank you so much. And I want to thank the audience for listening and tuning in today and wish you a wonderful weekend. And we'll see you all again next Friday. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Cornelia Stephanie Show, Wake Up to Love, Your Call to Action. Tune in each week on Transformation Talk Radio. Cornelia's joy is to engage others in practical ways, showing us how to live in the new earth in harmony with our true nature. For more information on Cornelia and her extraordinary work or to listen to past shows, go to her website at corneliastephanie.com.